and welcome to every one of you. Welcome to every. For, for those of you who do not know, I am uh, the pastor's father. So I'm Senior Blake. Some of you may not know that, so I'm just letting you know. Just letting you know. And this morning, our time together would be very interactive. So we'll be talking to each other. All right? I'll be, I'll be asking you to say certain things, repeat certain things. So our time today will be very interactive. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, coping with faith pressure. Coping with faith pressure. And our text is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. 2 Corinthians 4, 5 through 12. And we want to read. It says, for we proclaim, for what we proclaim is not ourselves. But Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessel to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. So that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Death is at work in us, but life in you. Now, I am sure that you would have heard the term peer pressure. I'm sure we would have heard that. Over the years, prayer pressure, rich as it relates to a young person, involves persons of his or her age group pressuring him or her to be engaged into practices that are compromising or sinful. Peer pressure. Some of you young people know what that is like. Probably at school. Prayer pressure. But little or nothing at all is said about another kind of pressure, which I see as faith pressure. Faith pressure. That is the challenge one faces from individuals, our situations, our circumstances to abandon faith. Faith pressure. That is what the Apostle Paul addressed in 2 Corinthians 4. Maybe are going through that right now. Faith pressure. Now, present, um, recently, here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, I heard someone who claims to be an atheist made this most disgusting comment to someone who had a conversation with him about God. What he did is that he turned around the letters in the name God to spell dog. Now, this is nothing short of blasphemy. In a Muslim country, this action carries the death penalty. 
Believe it or not, no one dares refer to the prophet Muhammad as a dog. No one. But in our democratic state, it is ignored. It's ignored. Or only receives a blush. That individual has since died by committing suicide. Any wonder? Died by committing suicide. And I saw it happen. I was there. I lived close to him. Now, if I did not mention this incident, perhaps we may not realize that in this country of ours that we regard as a Christian country, there are people who hold such disdain for the one whom we know and recognize as the sovereign Lord of the universe. And who according to our constitution, we as a people are charged to believe in. The supremacy of God. The supremacy of God in this nation. It's enshrined in our constitution that we believe in the supremacy of God. Whereas atheism in our country should be deemed illegal based on, uh, based on the tenets of our constitution. Because we live in a democratic country, one's belief therefore cannot be legislated. Belief in Jehovah God, the Bible, and the Christian faith have through the years been challenged ridiculed and rejected by many. Even in this so-called Christian country in our region, or countries in our region, Christians are being ridiculed and given derogatory names. In our country, Christians are called, are called Christophine. Christians, when I was growing up, they call us saved souls. In other countries within our region, there may be different insulting connotations. The Bible tells us about numerous people of faith who experienced persecution because they stood for God's truth. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, there is a long list of saints in the past eras who suffered greatly for their faith. Faith pressure. They are rightly given the title heroes of faith. Here's what the scripture says. Some face jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. Think of that. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goat skins. Think of that. They lost all their clothing. So they had to be clothed with sheepskins and goat skins. Destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. Hebrews chapter 11, 36 to 37. Why? Because of their bold stance of faith in God. Pay faith pressure faith pressure the challenge these saints faced was to conform to the world's presence to escape persecution but they remained obedient to God their obedience was costly yes costly but they found strength in their faith and in God's promises we can find inspiration in their examples when we are confronted with a choice between obedience to God and conformity to the world. Even today, in what is con considered an enlightened world, in several countries, Christians are still restricted from being verbal about their beliefs and practices relating to their faith in God. I looked at a short documentary recently where in this Muslim country, pastors are given long jail sentences if according to the government, they were charged and found guilty of converting 
others. Charged, found guilty of converting others. There was this one pastor who at his trial told the judge that he converts no one. Only God does. Only God converts. Folks, being born again is a supernatural occurrence. And no human being can prevent it from happening. None. No despotic leader. And I'm hearing now to what's happening in North Korea. What Christians are facing in North Korea because of their faith in Christ. Jesus said he will build his church. I'll build my church and the church consists of people in all countries of the world. I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Anti-conversion laws are powerless against preventing people from receiving Jesus. No laws, no laws of human government can prevent people from receiving Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord. Now, we may not face the same extreme obstacles that the people of the Bible experience or many are experiencing today or the violent persecution in many countries that are going on. But we do feel, we too, do feel deeply rejected when a friend stops inviting us to social events because our godly behavior and demeanor sets us apart. We do feel the pressure of a suffering career when we refuse to follow unethical business practices and as a result, we are overlooked for a promotion. We do feel that. We do feel harassed and humiliated when co-workers make us the subject of jokes and snide comments. We do feel tensions when a neighbor criticizes Christianity or uses God's name as a profanity. Yes, we do. But we must not let these challenges keep us from standing firm in Christ. Now, I myself experienced faith pressure when I was rejected from a job opportunity to become a teacher in my village of fancy. I was born up there. And when I was uh, about 14, I was still in primary school. We, we sat school leavings exams. I did extremely well at that exam. And there was, a, there was an opening in the school for a teacher. And my name comes up. And my name came up. The fact is, I'd given my life to the Lord at another church, a Baptist church. And because of the fact that I became a believer, and because of the fact that I had transferred church, I was overlooked. Now, you must understand, my parents were extremely poor. My mom and dad, poor. We grew up in very, very poverty-stricken and a very poverty-stricken environment. And uh, my getting a job as a teacher would have helped my parents, help them. But uh, I was overlooked. Someone else was given the job, and that person was given the job, also had made a profession like me. But, you know, I was told that if you recanted, You'll get the job. She recanted. She got the job. So here, here's what happened. I had a young pastor up there and he invited me to go to Bible college. So I finished school and then I enrolled into Bible college. The, the next, you know, the next is history. Look at where I am today. Look at the lives that God has used me to touch. My goodness. If I were a teacher, I would never make, I don't believe I would have touched so many lives. Folks, 
we must never, we must never recant. Despite of your faith challenges, because of faith pressure, you must never recant. Because if God is for us, then who is against us? Persecution does not weaken the church. It only strengthens it. Throughout history, it has been proven that when Christians were persecuted in one country, town, village, or community, they move to another and become stronger. Persecuted but not abandoned. Persecuted but not abandoned. Jesus said if they persecuted me, they would also persecute you. John 15, 20. We should expect no better treatment than that received by our Lord. So when suffering comes because of our faith and trust in Jesus, how can we handle it? How can we handle it? Well, we're going to be dealing with that. In 2 Corinthians, uh, in the text I read, 2 Corinthians 4, 5 to 12, Paul talked about his own sufferings. And suggested that through our weaknesses, through our frailty, God can shine through brighter. Paul said, it's not about you, it's not about me, it's about Christ in us. It's Christ in us. So imagine yourself in the crowd at the Corinthian church as Paul's letter is being read aloud. Let's listen in and see what lessons we can learn about making the most. Out of faith pressure. Making the most out of faith pressure. We're going to be looking at some lessons. So lesson one. You don't have to be in the spotlight. Because you have the light of Christ in you. You don't have to be in the spotlight. Because you have the light of Christ in you. Look at verse six. For God who said... Let light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul contrasted true believers with those false teachers who drew attention to themselves. They wanted to be in the spotlight. Yet Paul said it's not about you. It's about Jesus in you. Sometimes we feel the pressure to perform. Don't we? Yes, we do. We want to be bigger. We want to be better. We want to be louder. We want to be faster. We want to be smarter. We want to be prettier. And we want to be brighter. We are tempted to toot our own horns. To draw attention to ourselves. Yet Paul reminds us that Christ's light shines in our heart the moment we surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. His light shines in our hearts. In verse 6, Paul states that the one who spoke light into being at creation is the same one who puts the light of Christ in your heart. The moment you become a believer, you're spiritually recreated. If any man be in Christ, He's a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Now for Paul, this image of Christ's light was very personal indeed. You know, he became a believer when he was blinded on the road to Damascus. The light of Christ was brighter than the noonday sun. Paul asked, who are you, Lord? And the Lord answered, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Paul shared in detail about this light on at least three separate occasions preserved in the New Testament. Christ's blinding light, his blinding light changed him forever. Folks, I want you to listen to this key thought. I'm going to be saying it and we're going to repeat because I said to you, that this is going to be interactive. Write it down. Put it in a prominent place. And I'm going to tell you. I, I thought they would have had it on the outline. But I'm going to give it to you. God did not call me to blend in. But stand out. Say it now. God did not call me to blend in. But stand out. It's there. Look at there. Oh, praise God. Didn't see it on the outline. 
God did not cause. Say it now. Say it. Say it, everybody. Uh huh. Mark that down. God didn't call you to blend in, but stand out. There, there is this chorus we used to sing in Sunday school. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. So let me ask you, are you letting your light shine? Are you letting the light of Christ shine through you? You don't have to try harder. You need to trust more. Trust that God will use you as you make yourself available for his purposes. Philippians 2.13 says, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. The greater service one can be in is the service of God. The best service one can render in this life is service to God and his fellow men. Service to God and his fellow men. So how can you face faith pressure? Lesson one. Let's repeat it together. You don't have to be. Come on, repeat it. You don't have to be in the spotlight because you already have the light of Christ in you. Aha, good, isn't it? You don't have to be in the spotlight. You already have the light of Christ in you. Then our second point is the weaker we are, the more glory God gets. Amen. The weaker we are, the more glory God gets. Look at verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. The moment we are born, our bodies begin to die. The aging process sets in. Just as it did for our first parents, Adam and Eve. The moment they sinned. Death and dying is part of our sinful world. But now at least until God makes all things new. Yet, the good news is, the weaker we are, the more glory God gets. Paul gives an object lesson in verse 7. He says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not of us. Our bodies are like jars of clay. Or another translation reads earthen vessels. Or clay pots. The Amplified Bible calls them unworthy earthen vessel of human frailty. Un unworthy, unworthy earthen vessels of human frailty. My God, how easily we can go. How quickly. You think you're so strong? You can just go. Die. Whew. My pastor, the guy who I, we buried on uh, Mother's, um, Mother's Day, Pastor Myers, he was going to open the church, the, the, the gate, the gate of the church, which he always does. And, and when he puts the, 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 the key into the lock, he fell down there, right there at the church gate and never revived. Never revived. Amazing. Amazing. Clay pots. Earthen vessels of human frailty, folks. If a man thinks himself to be something when he's what? Nothing. He fools himself. I look in the mirror and I see a body much different than 30 years ago. Oh, yeah. I look, I, I have some photos at home with my wife and me. I look so young, 30 years ago, still having children. No, I do. I think I'm the same person, but the mirror doesn't lie. <laughs> our bodies, house, our spirits, rich for believers, will one day go to be with God. Our bodies go back. Into the soil from which they come, dust to dust, and ashes to ashes. Yet our spirits will live on with God's spirit someday to receive a new resurrection body. Hallelujah. 
to brothers and sisters in Christ, your struggle with faith pressure will be less stressful when you consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be to, for, with the glory, with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Remember, the weaker you are, the more glory God gets. Yes, the more glory God gets because his strength becomes perfect in our weakness. Hallelujah. 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 Then let's move to lesson three. Lesson three. Because of the gospel, you may get knocked down but not knocked out. Because of the gospel, you may get knocked down, but not knocked out. Look at verses 8 and 9. We're going to be coming to that. The, the Urban Dictionary describes the phrase, down but not out, as a resolve when a person has lost the upper hand in a competition or in life, but has not lost or quit. A person has lost the upper hand, in a competition or in life, but has not lost or quit. And we see it used in sports. For instance, consider the boxer who takes a beating, but keeps getting up. Takes a beating. You guys love wrestling and you see, you wonder how in the world those guys can get up. Although some of that's not real. But how do they get up? But they get up. Or a battering cricket who is peppered with bouncers but keeps batting to the end of the innings. Paul gives four poetic couplets to illustrate this truth in his own life and in the lives of believers going through hard times. Look at verses 8 and 9. We're going to be looking at those. In verse 4, in, now in these four couplets, four couplets of faith pressure, Paul talks about the difficulty and the outcome. The difficulty and the outcome. We are hard pressed. The difficulty on every side, but what? We are not crushed. The outcome, not crushed. Hard pressed. On every side, but not crushed. Then he said, we are perplexed. The difficulty. What's the outcome? We are not in despair. He said, we are persecuted. The pressure, the faith pressure. But we are not what? We are not abandoned. Then he said, we are struck down. But what? We are not destroyed. Hallelujah. The last statement of these couplets is a play on words in the Greek. The English equivalent might be, I am struck down, but I'm not struck out. Ah, I am at a loss, L-O-S-S, but I'm never lost, L-O-S-T. I may be, I may be at a loss. But I'm never lost. How cool is that? At a loss, but never lost. God's people are never losers. We are victorious. Jesus said that to lose one's life for his sake is to what? Find it. You lose it. You lose your life, but you what? You find it. Hallelujah. Because a believer's life is hidden with Christ in God. Hidden with Christ in God. So let us affirm this together. I may be at a loss, but I am never lost. Let's affirm that. Can we put it up on the board? I may be at a loss. Uh-huh. Let's say it again. I may be at a loss, but I am never lost. Hallelujah. Now, on Paul's first missionary trip, a crowd tried to stone him to death. They threw rocks at him until they thought he was dead. He was down, but not out. After the crowd drifted away, fellow believers helped him up and he moved on. 
talk about a rough beginning. I wonder if Paul was thinking about this event when he wrote these words. So, in summarizing the four couplets for the believer, it's not over until God says it's over. That's another one. It's not over until God says it's over. Let's say that. It's not over until God says it's over. <laughs> I love that. It's not over until or unless God says so. We may feel weak, lost, or adrift. Yet God's strength is at work in us. God will keep us in the fight as we depend on him instead of ourselves. And even when it's over, that just means eternal life has shifted from this life to the next. What's the worst they can do to me for my faith? What's the worst they can do to, to me for my faith? Kill me? That means I get to go heaven quicker? It's a win-win for me. For to me to live is what? And to die is, is gain. So what do they get for killing me? I got everything. I get everything. They lose, but I gain. So let's re-emphasize the key thought. Let's re-emphasize it. It is not over until God says it's over. And then let's move lesson four. You may suffer for your faith, but Christ will use your sacrifice to bring life to others. You may suffer for your faith, but Christ will use your sacrifice to bring life to others. Look at verses 10 to 12. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. We live in a time when popularity is coveted. People like to be liked. Yet sometimes you may have to suffer for your faith or God forbid die for it. Die for it. Paul did. Even as Paul knew his days were numbered, he did not despair. He knew that at any suffering or death for him means life for others. As they embraced the gospel through his witnesses, death is at work in me, but life is at work in you. So let's return to our initial thought as we wrap this up. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's all about Christ in us. Christ in us. The hope of glory. That is what matters, friend. Friends may come. Friends may go. Popularity may rise and fall. Yet if we follow Jesus, we may be down, but never out. It is said that many combat war ver veterans testified that a turning point in their deployment came at a time when they thought, I'm not coming home alive. I'm not coming home alive. The fear left them, and they were able to function fully when they came to that point. I'm not coming home alive. Without a crippling anxiety creeping in, in a sense, that is what happened to Paul here. He decided that he only had to please an audience of one. No one else mattered. If he lived for Jesus, he might die. But through his sufferings, others would live forever. Hallelujah. Embracing the gospel. Becoming new creatures themselves. Joining the family of God. And that made everything worthwhile. May we, here at High Point, take such a selfish, selfless approach to life. Jesus died so that we may live. We too must pre be prepared to sacrifice our lives through the proclamation of the gospel so others can live. Here is what 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15 says. 
For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should not live unto themselves. But for him who died for them and was raised again. So, as we face faith pressure. Remember these four important lessons from 2 Corinthians 4, 5 to 12. And the, the key thoughts. And so we're going to repeat them as we wrap this up. And I want you to get your notes. And we're going to go to the four lessons first. Four lessons first. So all of us now, we're going to, we're going to repeat those lessons. Lesson number one. I don't have to be in the spotlight because I have the light of Christ in me. Lesson number two. The weaker I am. Uh-huh, I'm hearing you. I'm, uh, I'm hearing over there. Number three. Uh-huh. And number four. Hallelujah. And now let's get the key thoughts. The key thoughts. God did not call me to blend in, but to Number two, it's not over for me until God says it's over. And number three, I may be at a but not lost. Hallelujah. Hey, glory to God. Let's face faith pressure. We are never at a loss. So let us pray. Bow your heads with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we see our bodies grow older and we experience the inevitable difficulties of life, Father, may we take heart knowing that you will use our weaknesses to magnify your greatness. Help others to see Jesus in us. Dear Lord, keep us from ever giving in to faith pressure. Build resilience in us. Father, remind us at all times that you have not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, of love, and of a song mind. Father, I pray that those who are in this service today without Jesus would embrace him as their Lord and Savior, realizing all of their sin, all of their pride, all of their inadequacies, all of their fear. Lord, may they surrender that to him and receive his forgiveness and let the light of his love, grace and mercy and peace shine through them along with a strong resolve to endure faith pressure against turning back or giving in. Oh God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, help our people. May we not just hear this message. You have given us this word today. May we not just hear it, oh God. But Father, may we practice it in our lives.